Today we'll hear about the achievements and 2013 legislative priorities for Oregon's advocacy commissions. But first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum winter corporate sponsors, Bank of the Cascades, Century Link, Miller Nash, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield, and The Standard. We're grateful for your support and commitment to the City Club mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all these sponsors. <laughs> Tickets are on sale for Congressman Earl Blumenauer's address to the City Club on February 22nd. Next Friday, we will hear two students and a professor from Portland State discuss the state of student debt and what it will take to move forward. Are you looking for something to do on Monday night? Join us at the Mission Theater to hear Carson Ellis and Colin Malloy of the Decemberists share fantastical tales and gorgeous illustrations from their first two books in the Wildwood Chronicles trilogy, based on Portland's very own Forest Park. You can learn more about future City Club events on our website, pdxcityclub.org. We'll be having a question and answer session with the panel at the end of today's program. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your questions. For all the audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the forum. We will collect them prior to the start of the question and answer period. And now, our program. Since 1983, Oregon's advocacy commissions have amplified the voices of Oregon citizens who are underrepresented in the corridors of political power, women, black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander Oregonians. Former Governor Vicatillo was the catalyst for creating the commissions on women, black, and Hispanic affairs. Governor Kitzhaber later started what is now known as the Commission on Asian Pacific Islanders. We're pleased to have former Governor Vicatilla and Governor Kitzhaber's Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Frank Garcia, here in the audience. Please join me in a warm round of appreciation for that. Today we will hear from the chairs and vice chair of the commissions about how much has been achieved, the challenges that remain, and the priorities for the 2013 legislative session. Renee Mitchell, our moderator for today, is an award-winning former journalist who was nominated twice for the prestigious Pulitzer Prize. She left a 25-year newspaper career behind to reinvent herself as a creative consultant K-12 writer-in-residence workshop facilitator and social justice grant writer. Andrea Cano is the chair of the Commission on Hispanic Affairs. She's a social justice advocate and communication specialist, and her international work, primarily through the Geneva-based World Council of Churches, sent her to 30 countries, including many in Latin America and the Caribbean. Isaac Dixon is the chair of the Commission on Black Affairs, and he currently serves as the vice, associate vice president and director of human resources at Lewis and Clark College. Mari Watanabe is the vice chair of the Commission on Asia Pacific Islanders. As executive, executive director of Partners in Diversity, Mari oversees this nonprofit whose mission is to help companies recruit, support, and retain new professionals of color in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Stephanie Vardavis is the chair of the Commission for Women. Stephanie has enjoyed a varied career spanning more than 30 years in the sports business and now is the principal in Ironic LLC and is engaged in mediation and arbitration. And without further ado, please help me welcome our moderator and the panel. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. We have quite a few questions that we'd like to go through, so we're gonna ask the panelists to kind of keep it very focused and brief, and if there are some things that you would like a little bit more explanation about, that we do that during the question and answer period from the audience. So let's get started. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask, what do you feel like each of your commissions have accomplished so far in the last 30 years, and 
where do you see yourself um, going? What are your goals for the next coming, the coming years? Well, I'll start. I think that, I, and I've only lived in Oregon for half of the last 30 years, so, it, but it's clear to me that the fate of women in general in American society and in Oregon has really changed immensely in the last 30 years. Women have opportunities open to them that were never open to them before, but there's been a lot more and better change at the high end socioeconomically than there has been for a lot of women who don't have elite educations, who don't have access to the kinds of resources, even you know, access to the internet at home, which a lot of, of lower income people don't have. So I think in a way we have a tale of two communities of women. Um, some women at the high end who have really seen opportunities blow open for them in that time. And women who are still struggling, who still have trouble making ends meet, getting the resources they need for their children. And those are the women that I'm mostly concerned about and think we need to be focused on. The Hispanic uh, Commission on, uh, has its antecedents in 1971, and if you pick up this little flyer, you'll see a little bit of, of that history that starts in 71, and it is in 1981 when uh, Governor Vicatilla takes this commission under his administration and turns it into the Governor's Hispanic um, Commission Affairs. And essentially the commission has been tracking the amazing population growth of our community the diversity of that growth in the state of Oregon to the degree that it is now giving the narratives of a diversity of people, of legal status. Uh, we are looking to see uh, the, the types of organizations that are um, just percolating throughout the state as we inch towards one half million Latinos in the state of Oregon. Our commission has also now joined the four advocacy commissions as a critical block of citizens' governance we also have an office now here in uh, Portland administered by Lucy Baker, administrator, and Nancy Kramer, our executive assistant. In terms of our legislative priorities, it works on two levels. One, the type of legislation that's going to move meaningful public policy for the well-being of our people and as well as for the well-being of all Oregonians. We're also looking at what also happens on the ground and nationally. So, for example, I was just on a conference call with Senator Merkley's office on the immigration reform, that wonderful paper that the bipartisan group issued a couple of weeks ago. Um, locally, we're looking at, of course, public safety so that all Oregonians on the roads have a driver's license and can get car insurance. Tuition equity, also uh, the issues of hate crime persecutions, prosecutions, as well as um, workplace uh, conditions and wage theft. Uh, we join a number of our commissions on their issues as well, and so I'm not gonna say much more because I know I'm gonna be echoed there as well. Thank you. Andrea, I'm gonna ask a, a quick follow-up question. Um, as, as Stephanie did, are there other issues that we need to know about that you don't think we, we have as much perspective about, about the community that you serve? Are there some certain things that there dealing with or facing that we should know about that we don't, that isn't obvious to us already? I think for one thing is to realize that the term immigrant is not a buzzword for Latino and vice versa. That there are three-fourths of us are legal residents, citizens, maybe go back generations, that we come from all kinds of uh, raices of different parts of Latin America. Uh, some of us have families that have been here four or five generations. Um, so that's probably one of the most biggest buzzwords. We have a, a seated Supreme Court judge, a Court of Appeals judge. We have amazing list of organizations, as you can see, that are just uh, jumping out all over the place. We're at a tipping point of critical political, social, and economic uh, successes. Thank you for that insight. Isaac? <clears throat> well, uh, hi, Renee, and um, uh, good, good afternoon to you all, and uh, th my thanks to the City Club for hosting the forum today. The Oregon Commission on Black Affairs uh, certainly has a rich history, and those who have lived in uh, Oregon for some time uh, know that uh, they've been uh, on the vanguard of political advocacy for a number of years, but I don't want to talk much about the past. I want to talk about what's going on now. Uh, we're in the process of filling some commission seats that are vacant, and um, we're in the process of 
refocusing the commission on collaboration with our uh, partner commissions and uh, also with community groups. We have a long-standing uh, relationship with the Portland Urban League. Um, we're rekindling relationship with the NAACP and some others uh, because the issues that uh, I'll talk about here real briefly that affect African Americans and our um, uh, communities of color and women throughout the state of Oregon are very, very similar. Um, the first uh, issue that we're focused on is education. Um, there's not much you can accomplish in this society without an education. And uh, as a uh, adjunct faculty member and a researcher uh, at heart, uh, I always tell people, don't believe what I say, look at the data. 9,800 children dropped out of school last year in Oregon. Ladies and gentlemen, that's unacceptable. Um, we as a state cannot make progress with dropout numbers such as that. It's impossible. It is a one-way ticket to the welfare line or the prison line. And disproportionately, it affects kids of color. 78% of the children who dropped out were from poor families or families that are struggling to make it. So that leads to my second priority, jobs. Um, in, in the area of jobs, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work and talking to policymakers about uh, not only job creation and policies to help stimulate job growth, but also the reintroduction of training programs um, that get young people who are interested in it working with their hands. Not everybody wants to be a college professor, nor should they. Um, there are lots of students who are interested in auto body work, in construction work, and other kinds of things. We need to give them opportunities to learn and to grow through high school, um, internships, other kinds of things that get them started much, much earlier. Number three, health care. Um, oh, yeah, we, 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 you know, we managed to see the fight over health care reform. But quite frankly, if you look at the, the, the statistics and the data around health care in uh, communities of color, uh, the numbers are not good. And uh, many of them are not trending the right way. So we certainly need renewed emphasis, K through 12, on physical education and physical activity. We need to educate people about what they eat and how they eat. And then, uh, most importantly of all, we need a safety net of healthcare services that make taking care of uh, healthcare problems early and a lot less expensively the norm. Finally, um, all these things tie into a, a broad issue that I'll just call justice. Going back to the education piece for a moment, disproportionately, the state data has shown, and once again, don't believe me, go look at the numbers, that children of color are disproportionately more severely disciplined in school. That means expulsions and suspensions. When you expel a student from school, there is a significantly greater chance that they will fail a core class. If they fail one or more core classes by the ninth grade, they drop out. Unless the kid is doing something really crazy, suspension and expulsion should be the last thing we do with them. You know, uh, and I would like to see the introduction, and uh, I saw it uh, in a school where my brother taught in Oakland, California, the introduction of more people who are community volunteers, retired folks, grandparents, um, to mentor these kids, to watch them, to sit with them, to talk with them. Children need that kind of support from adults. Kids haven't changed, folks. Adults have. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mari Watanabe with the Oregon Commission on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. And we are not 30 years old. We are much, much younger. <laughs> we're, we're only 18 years old. We were formed in 1995 by Governor Kitzhopper on his first term. We had an Asian uh, senator, John Lim, in office at that time, and he actually introduced the bill to form this commission. At, and the name actually was just the Asian, the Oregon Commission for Asian Affairs, and then later was uh, changed in 2011 to add the Pacific Islanders. But since we are much younger, we have had a little bit slower start. Uh, we, although Asians have been in this state for over 200 years, the first um, actually it was uh, Hawaiian, uh, came to Oregon in 1811, and after that, the Chinese, the Japanese, and later on, after the war, um, the other ethnicities. But we are um, 
very active. We are very engaged in our community. And in the short time we've been there, including the five years we were defunded, we still kept going and really engaged our community with our uh, government officials to help better the issues, um, improve the issues of the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. So one of them was actually holding public uh, focus meetings where we invited our community to come and meet the different state bureau directors and have conversations about what are the issues in the community, what can the state um, bureaus help them with, and actually open just that education and um, awareness of what it is that is going on in our communities because we are kind of quiet. We don't always, we're not always out there. So this was a great opportunity to have a dialogue. One of the other things that is very important to us is to engage our community in uh, civic engagement. So voter registration, voter education. Asians are the least likely to register to vote and we are the least likely to actually vote. So we need to get our community out there so that we do have a voice. Some of the things that were done, um, voter registration is, um, we've done things to, uh, we've had um, phone banking, we've actually been at uh, um, the events where they actually, um, sorry, the, when we get their um, US citizenship, we are there to help actually register them at that time. Uh, some great statistics from just this last election are that uh, we registered 3,000 and we engaged our community in the actual electoral process. We published 50,000 voters pamphlets in six languages and phone banked 14,000 API voters in 11 languages. That's huge. And if you didn't know, our community has 30 for 32, sorry, 32 different ethnic um, groups, and we speak 106 distinct languages just in Oregon. If you go worldwide, it's over 500. So we have, a, we're a big group, and we are not the same. We are not a one-size-fits-all, and we all, and there's, we, a lot of times we get to be clumped in that one Asian bracket, but we need to, one of my messages to you is that we are not all the same and that we do all have, all of our different communities have different issues, so. Thank you. So you guys have laid out a real laundry list of very important, impactful issues, whether it's healthcare, or poverty, physical activity, education, access to the internet. So given the state's budget situation and limited staff, how do you really assign priority to what you're trying to do legislatively? How can you really make the biggest impact as a commission? Well, um, I'll begin, and I'll say that by necessity, we collaborate. We, we reach out to our friends and our people who even aren't necessarily our best friends in the legislature. And we find out what they're interested in that is also a part of our agenda, and we collaborate with them to make the progress that we can make. In the community, not only do we collaborate with our fellow advocacy commissions, we reach out to nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, and we find out what they're working on, and we do our best to leverage the resources that we have and the resources that they have together to accomplish that which can be accomplished. So as much as we like to set goals and prioritize, sometimes we, I have certainly observed, it's, it ends up being more practical to figure out what is doable and work hard on getting that done. This year, for example, one of our number one priorities in the legislature is a bill that was actually drafted by a, a, a commissioner on my commission who is an attorney in Coos Bay, which is a bill that allows um, people who are, not just women, who are survivors of domestic violence to have the record sealed on name change applications in state government so that their abusers can't easily find them and, and hunt them down in the future. And this has been over a year of hard work on our part and 
engaging with members of the legislature and we're very optimistic that we can get this passed. So sometimes you just have to work hard, figure out what you can get done and then just go for it. Thank you. Uh, in just one area, uh, for example, in tuition equity, uh, we, you know, the big numbers of what's this going to cost the state. I, I try to remember that there's probably about 70,000 mothers and fathers who've worked here between 15 and 20 years in the service industry, agriculture, working, earning anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 hour, dollars an hour. After all that time, they're still earning eight to 12 to 10 hours, uh, dollars an hour. And now they have kids. This is, you know, a family that's contributed to the econ economy of Oregon, to the profitability of the service and agribusiness. And now they have children of college age. And these are the students who we believe uh, uh, need to receive that tuition equity to uh, attend school. They've done well in school. And so we need to look at what do we mean by the finances, just where are the values of labor and our contributions. I also wanted to say there's greater, uh, wider issues like uh, mortgage reform that hits all of us. It hits all of us across the board, and there's some critical uh, legislation going in to really track where, who holds the paper on our houses and the fees that these mortgage companies aren't paying that could really help undergird parts of our budget. So it's not just you know, ethnically based issues, that's something we look at everything that, that affects all of us. So let me follow up with that. So, so as on the issue of tuition equity, how do, how does your commission make an impact on that on that issue? We just bring the numbers. We bring the dollar numbers. We look at the lives of, of the communities uh, throughout the state of Oregon, uh, who are, you know, everywhere from all your county to Morrow, uh, the numbers of students that are uh, clearly. Uh, needing to go to the universities and luckily we really do have a lot of support from both sides of the aisle So we're really happy about that But it's going to take every single one of us here to call up our senators or representatives and echo back support from what you've heard from all of us um, <clears throat> uh, To echo what my uh, uh, fellow chairs have talked about uh, a lot of what we do and the way we're most effective is collaboration um, collaborating with others uh, identifying issues of common interest, and then um, finding members of the legislature that uh, we can work with and or convince um, to sponsor bills and legislation to make life better for all Oregonians. There's just a couple of things that have come up that I wanted to retreat to for just a moment. In this issue of housing, one of the things that we've been looking at and talking about is um, some of the rules around Section 8 housing. Um, it's harder and harder for people with Section 8 aid to be able to use their Section 8 vouchers. Um, landlords are not required to even take applications from people that get Section 8. And that leads to uh, areas of town where, well, you saw the Oregonian story, uh, more than 80% of Section 8 housing in Portland's located east of 82nd Avenue. You know, and if you want your children to go to a certain school or certain things to happen, it makes it very difficult to accomplish that. We're also looking at um, working on changing some uh, parts of the Section 8 legislation um, so that women fleeing domestic violence situations who get relocation aid from an agency don't have to declare that as income when they file their application to rent. That's another way that the uh, abuser tracks them down. Last but not least, um, one of the areas that uh, we'll be working on too is um, contracting. Uh, government and government-related contracting is a big business here in Oregon. And people of color and women-owned businesses don't get their fair share of contracts. The city of Portland has done a great job of putting together a program that works. And we're going to be working with the city of Portland to take some of those policies, procedures, and rules, and programs that work and uh, get those out to other jurisdictions in the state. Um, it's time that uh, women and people of color uh, who can meet the test and who have services to sell can get in on uh, contracting with government entities. So that's something we're going to be looking at. So the, with the Asian Commission Island 
uh, Affairs Commission. We uh, actually have some of the similar ones, but a couple I want to point out, and I wanted to just give you a few statistics uh, about the Asian population in Oregon. So we actually, in the state, in the United States, Asians are the fastest growing. We edge out the Hispanics just by a couple of percentage points. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But in Oregon, we are second as a whole community. If you actually separate out the Pacific Islander community, the Pacific Islander community is growing at 68%, which is far above um, the Hispanic community. So, but together, we're, we are second in Oregon. So there's over 213,000 uh, Asian Pacific Islanders in Oregon, and 70% of them live in our tri-state counties. Asians grew 46% and Pacific Islanders 68%, I said that. And actually another um, kind of a shocking statistic is that Pacific Islanders have a 40% poverty rate in our state, which is, which is really a problem. Um, some of the issues in education is one um, that we will be looking at is the um, ESL, English as a Second Language, or ELL, English Language Learners. Um, um, programs in our schools because 55% of API students in Portland public schools are English language learners and only 20% of these graduate on time which is huge and as our governor we're all trying to get to the 100% graduation rate we really need to look at these issues of being able to teach our kids how to speak English well so that they can graduate on time um, some of our families have stated that, that they don't have um, access to uh, these, these ELL or ESL instructors in their classes, so the, their kids get put into special education, and so they don't get the attention that they deserve or that pace to keep up with the rest of their classmates. So when they're in fifth grade, they're only reading at a first grade level. So we are working, we want to work with our um, government to help figure out ways to uh, alleviate this, because again, as I mentioned, 106 languages. How do we solve that problem? So we'll be looking at those. So I'd like to, uh, to have you break it down a little bit more for me, because when you talk about you're working on these issues, um, I'd like you to make it clear for me as an individual and as, as an Oregonian, how can I assist you? Is it a matter of calling legislators? Is it a matter of attending a meeting? How do you, how do you elicit my support? I know the issue of collaboration has come up a lot in leveraging um, the voices that you have in your communities. So how can each of us really allow, you know, get involved in what you're trying to do on these issues that are important to all of us? For us, I think some of the things you mentioned are definite. Uh, get involved, um, help us, support us. When you, when you see something come up, don't just say, well, it doesn't apply to me, because it applies to all of us. If we are to grow Oregon and Oregon is to be strong, we, we all have to do well. And since our populations are, de are changing, then if 50% of our population isn't doing well, then Oregon isn't going to do well. So APANO is one of our partners that we, that we work with. The APANO stands for the Asian Pacific Network of Oregon. And Joseph Santos Lyons is the new executive director there. And he, um, and we work together with them to help do a lot of this community work. So supporting Apano, um, yes, coming to our events, um, writing letters, supporting us when we go to the legislature, helping us find uh, ways to um, solve these problems together, come to community meetings, et cetera. Before Isaac uh, uh, chimes in, I want to uh, make sure that each of you allow us to, to understand how do we connect with you? Is there a website? Is there a newsletter? Are there, is there an email list? How do we know what's going on with what you're doing? Well, there certainly is a website um, for the Advocacy Commissions. Um, that's one way. And, uh, we, you know, I, we can certainly make sure that um, you have that information before we leave today. Um, but if you go to the web and you type in Oregon Advocacy, Advocacy Commissions, our web pages come up. So um, it's a wonderful place to do that. I think the other thing, um, from my mind, one of the great things about the state of Oregon that I've loved since I moved here in 1978 was that, I haven't ever lived any place where you could be closer to your government than here. Um, believe me, in some other states in the union, uh, the people who are legislators are pictures on a wall. 
But here in Oregon, I remember one year, uh, many years ago, my mother was at um, the newly opened Pioneer Square with me, and uh, we were uh, strolling across the square when a voice said, Isaac! And I turned around. It was former Governor Barbara Roberts coming across the square. We hugged each other. I told my mother who it was, and she was a the governor? <laughs> I tell people, you can make a difference here, unlike a lot of other places in the country. Um, there are more than 300 boards and commissions that need public servants. Um, put your hand up. Uh, you know, closer to your neighborhood where you live, there's a neighborhood association. Sometimes, you know, block associations. Um, but it starts with getting to know the neighbor next door, the kid down the street, and then um, take hold of uh, uh, helping govern your own neighborhood. Uh, I, I think that that's critical. And I certainly, from my point of view, last but not least, I think that we owe it to the next generation to help them understand the importance of civic institutions and governance. Um, I've seen too much uh, being devoted to um, students passing standardized tests. I understand those are important. But we're giving short shrift to what it means to be a citizen. Not just your rights, but your obligations. And I think that all of us can help in that education process and connect people more through where they live today and uh, the institutions that are right around them. It doesn't have to be anything big and exotic. It can be something as simple as going to your neighborhood association meeting and talking, uh, speaking up. Um, it, that just comes to me because I've seen what has happened to North and Northeast Portland as a result of gentrification. When you go to public meetings and you impact public policy, you end up having a say rather than being run over by the result. And that's, that's what I'd, I'd like to emphasize. It used to be said that uh, Sunday morning worship was the most segregated hour I think it's brunch. <laughs> it really is, brunch in this city, in this area, probably throughout the state. And I think part of it is, is understanding where we do have some convergences of coming together. Uh, you know, become our friends on Facebook or become friends on an amazing number of organizations. Even I look at Jules uh, here, who, who's with the Hispanic News um, or the Rural uh, Development Initiative. There's all kinds of organizations. What I put on here is just a sampling of people. Uh, we are 44 commissioners. Invite us to come and talk with your organization. Uh, uh, and also the last thing I wanted to say is to really echo Echo those wonderful points of positive sparks that's happening. You were talking about contractors, and we now have a Hispanic contractors group of builders. It's the Diversified Builders and Engineers Council that's tracking the same. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the Hispanic Bar Association, the teachers who are tracking how to get more of our folks to be the teachers and administrators of our schools. So there's a lot of people that we can also put you in touch with in the arts, in the science, engineering, architecture, the green movement, we're present everywhere. And we're willing to share our perspectives with you. B briefly, I would add to that, that there is really an enormous amount of work to do. So it's not for us to tell you where you should start. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you passionately care about and get after it. Because if you passionately care about whatever it is that you're working on, you will be a far more effective advocate. And you will not run out of gas partway through and give up because it's just too hard. Because being an advocate is hard. I started out in, in Portland as a library advocate. I'm a former president of the Friends of Multnomah County Library. And I'm thrilled that we've reached a point where Multnomah County Library has a stable source of permanent funding. And the Friends now have the opportunity to reinvent themselves as an organization that advocates for the library in, in other ways and advocates for library use and, and users. But the point is, that was my path. Everyone has their own flashpoint, their own passion. Individually, Figure out what that is and just decide what's important enough to you that you're willing to give up some hours out of every week or month of your life 
pushing at it, even though it pushes hard, it's hard to push and the, the, the giant boulder rolls really slowly because that's how we make progress. So we're gonna take um, questions from the audience shortly, but I wanted to give you an op opportunity if there are any differences between your communities here in Oregon and that those same communities in other states. Is there something particular about living in this area? I think for us, uh, Latino community, I think Oregon is where California was 30, 35 years ago. I think now we're at the tipping point with a critical mass of people seated everywhere in civil and government sectors. Uh, Oregon also is one of six states that relies on agricultural labor in ways that can't be mechanized. So this is something that makes this very, very different from other states. Um, for us, we, we do all have the same issues across the United States. Uh, I listen, I'm up, uh, the President Obama put into effect in 2010 the White House Initiatives for Asian and Pacific Islanders Affairs. And so it's surprising, it's, 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 maybe it's not surprising that all, the all Asians across the country are still having similar issues that we do here. But one of the, one of the standouts is that Multnomah County is, their kids, our kids are doing far, far worse than our, our peers in Seattle and, um, and in California. I think uh, one of the major issues uh, for the uh, uh, black community here in Portland and uh, in the state of Oregon uh, is a brain drain. Uh, some of the brightest and the best uh, leave here to go to colleges and universities out of state and never come back. And um, that's a, a trend that we have to work hard to reverse. Um, many uh, young people see um, little in the way of career or economic opportunity. And so they um, uh, go to college in Atlanta or someplace else, and uh, they never come back. And I'd like to see us reverse that trend. I think that uh, over the long term, the state prospers when our brightest and best stay here to go to school as opposed to leaving state. Briefly, I would just say, echoing off what Isaac just said, I think especially in the Portland area, there's a huge uh, uh, bubble of activity here in um, startups, in yep. young companies just getting started that are doing really original, innovative things. But in general, these companies are mostly being founded by men, populated by men, and men are the, men are the risk takers and men are the reapers of the reward. And so one of the things that I'm interested in working on is developing a resource that will link Oregon girls to information about non-traditional career paths, STEM education, mentorship, leadership development, entrepreneurship resources mm -hmm. to enable girls in Oregon to be emboldened to seize some of the same opportunities that young men are seizing. I'd also like to give you guys an opportunity to talk about if there's any events coming up. I know there's a legislative day that the Urban League is organizing, Women's History Month is coming up. So if there's opportunities for the audience and those listening on OPB or the uh, community media to get involved uh, on a particular event, and I'm, Andrea, I'm glad you mentioned Facebook. Um, we should be also liking their pages and finding out what's going on. So is there, are there particular events you'd like to push and the information maybe you have on the back table? Sure. Uh, February 19th, as you mentioned, um, is a legislative day in Salem, uh, sponsored, uh, co-sponsored with the uh, Urban League of Portland. And we had a great turnout last year. Um, people who hadn't been to Salem in years were down there. And um, uh, we had a wonderful time, a great reception by legislators. They really appreciated it. And uh, just uh, earlier this week, uh, we, uh, we were in Salem when Governor John Kitzhaber signed a proclamation recognizing uh, Black History Month uh, here in Oregon. So, um, lots going on. Um, I'd like to mention that one of the things the Oregon Commission for Women does annually is recognize women of achievement in the state of Oregon. And we last uh, handed out these awards in October of 2012. What we're gonna do for 2013 is push the award forward into the spring of 2014, give it for 2013, but push it into the spring season because we think it's easier to get 
traction for a major event in the springtime. Uh, there's less competition for people's attention and frankly also for their money. Mm -hmm. But we want to know from you who you know of, who are women in Oregon who are making a difference, who are achieving great things, who aren't necessarily famous, who aren't necessarily conventionally successful and wealthy, but who are having an impact in their communities and achieving. And so if you want to send an email to chair.ocfw at gmail.com, I would personally love to hear your nominations. And if you're interested in looking at our website, it's oregon.gov slash women. There are amazing uh, a number of events that are either Latino-led or Latino-participating in the next month. Uh, now, this month and next month as well, uh, in Salem, a lot of different advocacy days. And we're actually trying to put together another advocacy day towards the end of March with about 30 Latino organizations throughout the state uh, coming to Salem. The other is not just events, but amazing movement now to uh, create a, a statewide collaboration for voter registration. Latinos, and this is really in preparation of 1214. So there's great movement, great uh, strategies to, to go into that effort. And the other is that since we're celebrating our 30th anniversary, we're beginning to look at who are those 30 top leaders? Who are those 30 top young leaders coming up? Who are some of the historical figures who really uh, added to the history of our community? And I'll tell you, one of my biggest goals is to update the Blue Book of Oregon so that it <laughs> <laughs> includes some significant information about us. We've been here since 1860-something. Now, I know none of you have mentioned donations. Are, do you accept money? Uh, do you accept? <laughs> <laughs> and where do we give them to you? So, just briefly. We really are, uh, are, the funds that we receive on the biennium are extremely slim, and so a lot of things are going out of pocket. I know that some of our commissions, uh, the women in the Asian Pacific Island, you can speak for yourself, but they have a better uh, role of, uh, in history of moving uh, into fundraising, but yes, we do, and uh, any donation is clearly, clearly uh, welcomed. Yeah, we have a pretty much of a shoestring budget, the Oregon Advocacy Commissions. We've uh, been the subject of being completely defunded back in 2001. And then once the, um, we were refunded, of course, we've gone through the same budget constraints that every other state bureau has gone through. So um, we basically volunteer our time and our efforts, and a lot of our expenses are unpaid. Um, so if you would like to donate, of course, we would take money from you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but some of the, and I wanted to just mention that the, um, through Apano, we are also doing a legislative day on, on tax day, April 15th, down at Salem. And in between now and then, uh, through Apano as well, we, they are doing some education programs to, to teach people how to go to, to Salem and how to talk to legislators. And actually a little even educating them about the, some of the bills that we're interested in supporting. So you can um, look at their website as well. I just want to add that one of the, the annual events for us coming up in April is an event called Equal Pay Day. And Equal Pay Day marks the date in April that a woman has to work until to uh, on average, to equal the earnings of a similarly situated man from the year before. So it is, um, it's a symbolic day, and because these are averages, um, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily 100% accurate for any individual woman, but as long as women on average are making about 84 cents for every dollar that men earn, and women of color are coming in at closer to 69 cents for every dollar that white men earn. This is gonna be an ongoing event for us. Isaac, we're gonna have you close out and then we're gonna take some questions from the audience. Sure thing, um, just like everybody else, yes, the Commission on Black Affairs <laughs> needs money. Um, and uh, we're gonna be holding a major fundraising event, uh, I think uh, in March or April. Um, we're working on putting the details of that together now. And so we'll have some publicity on it. Um, Cash, check, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, we'll take them all. Um, but yeah, yes, just like the rest of the commissions, uh, funds are tight and um, any donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, sharing your information and, and the insights today, I appreciate it.
Uh, we are now going to take questions from the audience. If you have a written question on an index card, would you please hold it up high so that City Club staff can collect it from you? Thank you very much. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today's Friday Forum host, Ted Kay. Ted has been a longtime member of the City Club, 13 years. Currently, he's chair of the Centennial Committee, serves on the Finance Committee. He's former treasurer of the club, and he coordinates our regular new member orientation meetings and uh, has been a longtime contributor to the success of the club, overseeing part of its legacy society for uh, plan giving commitments. Uh, he's the, also the go-to person for trivia about the club, so <laughs> Ted. Thank you, thank you, Pat. Uh, here's my question. City Club has adopted a goal of diversity for its membership. That includes gender, ethnicity, age, and even political affiliation. Uh, a question for each of you. What can City Club do to make it membership in the club more attractive to the communities that you represent? Hello, testing? That's it? Oh, 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 we have one. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Um, uh, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, I think attracting diverse membership to the city club depends on two things. Um, number one, uh, compelling programs and a program of work. People love joining a winner. And when you have, a city club has a great reputation, but I think that um, programs that deal with contemporary topics, such as this one today, um, and work that gets them out in the community and touching other people is what um, uh, busy, engaged citizens of all types want to do. Second of all, uh, and I don't want to belie this for a moment, do your outreach work. Uh, visit your community partners. Go to neighborhood association meetings. Touch base at the grassroots. I think that you know, Portland is very much a grassroots city, and the more you get out and talk to community members on the ground, um, the better the response will be. Oh, I agree, and I think the other is to uh, also stimulate the, I think you started a kind of a young professionals or young mm -hmm. uh, membership and really move that. I mean, we're in the midst of all kinds of universities and uh, younger professionals that are really uh, filling the workforce here, particularly downtown, and it should be an easy draw for you. I would add that it's not expensive necessarily to join the city club, but it isn't cheap to join the city club either. And I think that in terms of attracting a more diverse uh, membership, particularly when you're talking about younger members and members who maybe are earning a little bit lower salaries than some of your current members, one of the things you might want to do is look at a tiered membership where maybe for the first year of membership to, you know, sort of like the, uh, the dealer on the corner from the first taste is free. Maybe you, uh, you want to offer people a discount on their first year of membership. Get them hooked. Get them into the city club. Let them understand what the benefits are. And, and uh, you might also want to, in your outreach to community organizations, allow organizations to become city club members and share the benefits of membership with individuals who are active in the organization so that the economic burden of joining the city club doesn't fall so heavily on the shoulders of somebody who may have other financial things they're worried about. My name is Sharon Joy, a city club member. As you will notice, I have no peers here nor outside, I don't even know one, because I've been escaping from nursing homes since 89. And uh, in the nursing home, we can't go outside. We can't take our own aspirin. So each time I have to say goodbye, and I have to try to fend on my own. So I go to somebody like uh, Saltzman. He says, you have to have at least 10 people, or I can't help you. Uh, I go to fish. And he says, uh, bring, come for a, uh, but bring your think tank. Well, where is my think tank? 
because all of my people are dying in nursing homes. And I cannot find a community for us because they think we don't want to associate with our peers. So the point being is I would like, but I don't know how to achieve this. And so if you've got any suggestions, I would like a building for each type of major disability so we can have some peers and we can start being somewhat independent. I would very much appreciate any advice. Any well, of you I don't know if I have advice, but I, I really uh, echo your concern, Sharon, and I think uh, that is a concern with, with a great constituent group within our communities as well in terms of having access um, and know that I know that I'm going to take that back with, to my commission to, to work through. Thank you. I, I should have introduced the questions from the floor by noting that, as always, the uh, privilege of asking questions at the City Club microphone is for City Club members. If you, before you ask your question, uh, could introduce yourself as a City Club member and ask it as directly as possible, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Province King City Club member. Uh, for a long time, you've been struggling to get funding to really do your work. I, I remember um, four years ago, two years ago, your advocacy fund has been gone. What exactly do you think you can do, given the level of discrimination, given the work that needs to be done, given the institutional uh, difficulties, and given the disparities? Uh, do you actually think we are right for a comprehensive civil rights commission? Well, <clears throat> we were defunded in 2001, and then uh, I think we were in, reinstated into the budget in 2005. But during that time, um, Carol Suzuki, who was the chair of the Asian Commission at that time, really took all the commissioners and, and really worked with them in her home, basically, and kept the work that, was, that the commission was working on alive and going until we were able to be... Uh, um, funded as again, and I think it's going to always be a struggle. I think right now we are very fortunate that Governor Kitzhopper is very supportive of our commissions, and we hope that the work that we do will will provide proof that we're worth keeping around and having long past if Governor Kitzhopper <clears throat> leaves office. So I think it's just going to be an ongoing um, uh, challenge that we'll tackle as as it comes up. Um, I would just observe, promise, and thank you for your observations, that the alternative is to give up. And we're not going to do that, okay? Because you're looking at some pretty stubborn people up here. <laughs> and our fellow commissioners are no less stubborn than we are, and in some cases, even significantly more stubborn, which would probably come as a shock to my husband, but it's true. So we are going to keep chipping away at this thing because that's what we have to do. And we're going to do it with whatever resources, whatever uh, financial and, and personal resources we have because that's the thing that moves us. And so we're just going to keep after it. I think when you realize something, we represent probably almost 2 million Oregonians. And when we look at the tax base generated by our own taxes alone, we've got to think about a significant percentage that should be able to contribute to the running and the operation of, of this citizen government body? I think, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to focus my work on um, for the balance of this calendar year and into the future is uh, putting together a, um, a sustainable fundraising infrastructure for the Commission on Black Affairs. Uh, I think to do otherwise is nonsensical. I think that government funding will always be cyclical and up and down, and uh, I'd like for us to be able to build a fundraising infrastructure to support um, the work that we do uh, without interruption. I think uh, to your second question about the comprehens uh, comprehensive civil rights bill, I think it'd be a difficult pass right now, given the focus on budget priorities in Salem. But I do know 
that the issues core to civil rights, like education, health, jobs, and justice, are things that the legislature is going to be focusing on and talking about, and we will be there at their door. Hi, I'm Joyce Damanen, City Club member. Um, thank you for your presentations today. Um, the issue of retirement security is a pending crisis for many Oregonians without workplace retirement plans, especially um, Im implicating communities of color and women. In fact, it's been said that the number one predictor of poverty and old age is motherhood. Are any of the commissions actively addressing the issue of retirement security? I think on one end, just, just I could say no right now from our commission. Uh, it's also because uh, the growing Latino community, the, the median age is much, much younger. So in a sense, we're kind of concentrating on early childhood, birthing, so health issues. But I thank you for raising that for us. Uh, I would have to say that um, it, it certainly is a topic that has come up a couple of times, but we haven't focused on it. I think that um, one of the things that we can do is, and, and I, I speak for, I think, uh, all of us, is to focus on, throughout the educational process, teaching people how money is made, how money is spent, and how money is saved. Um, I think that what's happened in the United States is we have become a nation of uneducated consumers. And when you do that, especially in communities of color, you pay much more in interest, and you tend to acquire lots of depreciating assets cars with high notes, lots of clothes, stuff like that. So getting that education to young people sooner to help change those habits is something that we're gonna focus on. We have to. And I would just like to add that it is a big issue and um, one of the things that we've been working on addresses it more indirectly, which is to say um, in terms of preparing girls from a young age to take control of their lives in a way that girls of other generations maybe weren't educated, weren't expressly prepared, helping them understand that they ultimately have to own their own uh, prosperity. They have to own their own security and be responsible for what happens to them through their whole life cycle. They can't rely on either Prince Charming or necessarily even um, a particular job to last them their whole lives. There isn't any kind of lifetime security anymore. So um, having said that, we have not been addressing the issues as they relate to older women and it's, I'm grateful that you brought it up. Virginia Cornyn, City Club member. Each of you in one way or another talked about cooperation and collaboration. I would like to ask each commission to give a brief example of where your commission has aided one of the other commissions on an issue or one of the other commissions has aided you so that we see the collaboration across issues from all of the commissions. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I, an example that pops to my head was just, this, um, uh, just a few months ago, uh, we worked with the uh, 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 Commission on Hispanic Affairs, and we shared an intern um, in doing work on the hate crimes bill. And uh, that was a great collaboration. Um, uh, got a great law student who did some terrific work and helped us uh, uh, look at um, reforecasting and reformulating some parts of the hate crime bill. So that's one example for you. We're sharing another uh, intern to do uh, tracking some of the educational programs as well. And we're sharing an intern who is going to actually do work across all the commissions on uh, resources for girls in Oregon, girls of color, girls of various ethnic um, communities, and the nonprofit organizations that serve all of the ethnic communities in Oregon to help connect girls with um, educational opportunities, mentorship, and leadership development. Yeah, the same with the Asian Commission. We, have, we share similar interests in immigration and tuition equity, um, health care, et cetera. So 
we are work we will be working together in this next session we also meet try to meet once a month by phone and quarterly face to face to really go through a whole string of issues and to be able to resource one another that way and in December, uh, the four commissions, we got together and actually had all of the state bureaus come and meet with us to talk about what they were doing um, uh, within their own bureaus to educate us and also to hear from us and be a res and we are trying to be a resource for them more and more. I'm sorry that we've run out of further time for questions today and we'll have to stop. Please join us next week to discuss the student debt crisis and as we close for today, Please join me in thanking our panelists, Andrea Cano, Isaac Dixon, Mari Watanabe, and Stephanie Vardavis, and our host and moderator today, Renee Mitchell. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>